Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Sarah, you are the best church that any pastor could ever possibly want to serve. And uh, it made me want to get back here even quicker and just to be able to bring the Word of God. Now, let, let, me, let, me, just, let me just get to the point. It would, it would have probably been uh, appropriate for me to come today to preach and address what is going on in our nation and to publicly and uh, from a leadership perspective and standpoint to decry all forms of racism. Uh, I believe it's an affront to God. I believe it's an abomination to God. And it would have been very easy for me to come and address the ills of our country. Um, that would have probably been a good thing. But the fact of the matter is it would have been a human thing today rather than a God thing because of what God is doing in my life personally. Uh, I wanted to come and just share uh, because it really be more genuine and more transparent uh, just to talk with you a little while about what God is doing uh, in me and the overflow of what he's doing. And, and that always makes great preaching uh, when you can just speak and preach from the overflow of what God's doing in your own heart personally. Uh, but uh, don't mistake uh, where I believe that uh, you and I as men and women of God, uh, we've got to get to, we, we've got to do our part in showing uh, brotherly love and kindness and uh, really reaching out for those difficult and tough conversations uh, that I've already had and uh, come a long way in. So I will get to that. I promise you before long, I will get to that. Uh, but today I had to be true to what I know God is doing in my heart and my life. I didn't want to be in the flesh. That would have been easy to do. Uh, I just wanted to be where God wanted me to be and just speaking out of my heart. Pastors often make the huge mistake. Uh, let, let me preface that before I go any further. Uh, <clears throat> The number one comment that I have received from people is, Pastor, thank you for your rawness at the homegoing service of your grandson. Thank you for the genuine way in which you approached that and you showed your hurt and your humanity and all of that. That's the number one. I, not everybody was happy about that. I, I had some preacher friends of mine that kind of second guessed and questioned that, but uh, that's okay. Uh, but, uh, that, that's, that's where pastors oftentimes make a huge mistake. And that is we parade the victorious testimonies before our people. Uh, we will talk about all of the victories that have come, but sometimes we're not honest enough and genuine enough to talk about some of the defeats uh, that we experience as well. For instance, recently there was a professional that had moved here from halfway across the country and uh, he brought his business here, his talents and gifts um, from uh, another state where he had the wonderful opportunity of spreading the gospel through his business and thinking that that was going to happen here in the Charlotte area only to discover that the people that he served wasn't happy about it and it finally led. Now we, we hear about Men who, man, they use their business to preach the gospel, but sometimes we don't hear the fact that while they were preaching the gospel, it brought about a huge amount of pressure on their life to the point that they had to go do something different. Uh, we, we parade and celebrate when God heals somebody. We will have them come and they'll say, I'm sick, and we will anoint them with oil and uh, pray over them, and then we celebrate when they come and say, you know what, God has healed me. But what about those times uh, when people come and we anoint them with oil, and we pray over them with the same fervency that we prayed over the others, but a few days later we have their funeral? We don't hear about that, do we? We don't talk about uh, those issues. I have shared stories, and you've heard them about people that you know, I, I'm, I'm going to start tithing this particular Sunday and then they tithe and then that following week they get this humongous raise or they get this big promotion at their job and we say, wow, look how God came through. 
But what about the 27 year employee that has been tithing since he was saved and all of those years faithful on his job, faithful to tithe and he goes in during the pandemic and they say, you know what? We are phasing your position out. We don't hear about much of that, do we? So it brings me to the question this morning. Does God always come through? Do God's people always appear to have happy endings? Practically speaking, we hear it preached from many pulpits across this land, erroneously I might add, that if you have enough faith, it's all going to be all right. If you have enough faith, Everything's going to turn out positively on your behalf. May I ask you a question? Does everything that we desire and hope for always turn out like we wanted it to? How many of you have had a matter of prayer in your life and you prayed about it, you sought God about it, and maybe even you had a word that you claimed on it uh, but you wound up being extremely disappointed. Would, would you just hold your hand up just a minute? I, I've had times of disappointment in my life. It didn't turn out the way that I thought. I think about Joseph uh, in the Old Testament. He got a word from God. God revealed himself to Joseph. And Joseph said, wow, God, I can't wait for this to happen. He tells his brothers about how God had spoken to him and what the end result was going to be and the brothers weren't happy about it. They threw him into a pit until somebody came along that they could sell him to and they sold him in slavery. He winds up down in Potiphar's house where he was accused of rape and they threw him in prison. Can you imagine a little bit what may have been the thought processes of a guy by the name of Joseph and he's saying, wait a minute, God, you know... This is what you told me. Uh, this is what I thought. This is what I expected. And wait a minute, I, I'm in slavery and now I'm wound up in prison. This is not turning out like I thought that it was going to turn out. I heard about an old Quaker philosopher. As a matter of fact, I read it this week. Uh, he, he made this statement. He said, it's no wonder God doesn't have any more friends considering how he treats the one he already had. So, so what's the answer to the question? Does God always come through? Now the fact of the matter is, no. Hmm. But that may be the fact of the matter, but it's not the end of the matter. Can I get a hallelujah? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 3. Those of you that are watching live stream and maybe through the internet on our website or whatever means that you're watching today, Daniel 3 is one of the most familiar passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. And you all know that story, how that King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he fashioned this golden idol of himself. And then he sent out a decree all over the land and he said now boys when you hear the band strike up when, when the band starts to play their music doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing I want you to face east and I want you to bow down and I want you to worship this image of me and he sent it out and said it's non-negotiable everybody he gets word that there are three Hebrew children uh, that are not obeying his commands Calls them in. He said, now, now boys, uh, you know, there's some consequences behind this. Is it true? Is it true that you're not going? And if it's true, Shadrach, if it's true, Meshach, if it's true, Abednego, I, I want you to know that uh, I'm going to throw you into a fiery furnace and take your life. Now, notice with me, if you will, in um, verse 15. We'll just read it now. Uh, you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp. And he goes into all of that. Worship me not. You're going to be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. 
And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now watch verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we get you. We hear you. Uh, you, you know, we're down with that. We're not careful to answer you in this matter. Now watch verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Our God's able. If God so chooses, if God determines in his sovereign counsel with himself, that uh, he doesn't want us to be hurt in the midst of this. God's able to deliver us. Oh, but go on with me. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which you've set up. What, what a tremendous attitude that these boys had. It, it's really an attitude that every one of us in this room must have as we navigate the issues of this life. God's able to deliver us. God's able to set us free. God, God's able to get us through this mess. Uh, God's able to, 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 to cause us to have victory in the midst of what is looking like sure defeat. God's able if he chooses but life is filled with these next few words. With trial after trial, with test after test, God is able if he chooses, but if not. Life's filled with but if nots. It's true, King, we're not gonna bow down. And if you choose to want to throw us into the fiery furnace, you just know that our God's able to deliver us, but if he chooses not to, wow. Great attitude here. We're not going to bow down. God's able. In other words, they were saying very much the same thing that Job said when he was filled with sores, when he was stripped of everything that he had ever known. He said, though God slay me, yet will I serve him. Same spirit, same, same attitude. You, you, you know, you say, Pastor, you know, that really sounds good. And, and Pastor, I've been uh, going to church about all my life and I've been serving God extensively for all of these years. And I, I, th those, those texts make great sermons and I love to hear about it. But how in the world can I live like that? I'm not able to get there. That's, that's wonderful for the heroes of faith, but how can I be there? Here's a little poem that helped me in these last couple of weeks. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way. She left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. Um, I want to I give you some things that I have learned in my walk with God and some things that I am being reminded of in my walk with God and some things that I'm learning and still learning and have to learn over and over again. I think it's really something that we have to uh, remind ourselves daily. You ready? Got a pen? Number one, remember God's love is dependable. Remember God's love is dependable. Now listen to Philippians 4, 8. What, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue and if there's any praiseworthy, meditate on these things. But what a powerful word. Every one of us in this room, it was amazing. I asked how many of you were disappointed sometimes 
uh, in your life, and just about everybody here raised their hand, you, there have been times that you have prayed about something, you sought God about something, thought you had the answer from the Word of God about something, and it didn't turn out that the way that you thought that it was going to. We've all been there. But in the midst of it, one of the things we have to remember is that God has demonstrated his love toward us many, many, many times in the past. And because he has shown us his love for us so many other times, we've had a whole lot more of that to show us that he cares and loves us. And the Bible says we're not to focus in on the things that have, we've disappointed, but remember all of the times of your past that God loved you. I've shared this story two or three times in the last 37 years, but in 1969, um, I went into the military uh, in the Army and was going to serve for a couple of years, and I made my mind up. You know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to go to Vietnam, and I'm going to volunteer to go, and I did just exactly that and uh, had my heart set on, on going. And I said, you know what, if I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go with the highest rank possible because I want to make as much money while I'm over there. I won't be spending any money. And I'll come back and I'll have me a good little nest egg when I get back. And it all worked out in my mind. So I went to school and I made E5 in less than nine months. I was up for E6 uh, right before I was to ship out to go to Vietnam. Three weeks before I was to leave. God divinely intervened. Totally out of left field completely unexpected, changed my orders and sent me to Fort Hood, Texas. Now, I'll be honest with you. It took me a long time. It took me several months, and maybe if you talk to my wife, she'll say even years to get over that. But just a few weeks after I arrived at Colleen, Texas, God gloriously saved my soul. He demonstrated his love toward me. Now, I could give you Example after example after example since 1969 how God has demonstrated his love toward me. And so when these disappointments come, I already have so much in the bank of how much God has shown me his love. I just have to remember, I, I may be disappointed right now, but I know that God still loves me. A friend of mine uh, just recently in these last few months uh, he had a couple of airplanes, and he was going to buy his third, and uh, he ordered it, and he kept waiting and waiting and waiting, and the negotiations uh, just didn't seem to be going anywhere, and uh, his order was delayed and delayed, and, and finally he just said, well, forget it. A few days later, he read where that exact plane that somebody else ultimately bought crashed. And he immediately thought, God, you love me, don't you? How many times in your past has God shown you that he loves you? So when the disappointments of today come and things don't turn out the way that you thought that they were going to turn out, just remember, God, more than you can imagine, has shown you many, many times that he loves you. Our God is able to deliver us. God is able to set us free. God is able to work it all out like we want it to be. But if not, let me give you number two. You ready? Realize his purpose is declared. <clears throat> his purpose for your life, his purpose for his children has already been declared. We, I used a uh, passage of scripture in Cameron's home going the other day that is one of the most misquoted yet memorized and uh, misunderstood passages in all of the Bible. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, we know that all things work together for good. That, that doesn't end there. That's not a blanket statement for everybody. We know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and those who are the called according to his, what? Purpose. God's got a purpose for everything that happens to his children. He's declared it for us. But don't stop with that one statement. Because the Bible tells us in the very next word, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. 
He's already decided, here's the outcome, here's where I'm going, here's what's leading up. He says to be conformed, how? To the image of Jesus. So, so in other words, ladies and gentlemen, from the very moment that God saves you until the day that he carries you to glory, his divine purpose for all of these things that happen in your life is to get you to be more like Jesus. His purpose has already been stated. So when you get saved, you're like a big old block of marble and God is standing there before that block of marble and he looks at us and he says, man, you're a hot mess. <laughs> so he takes out his hammer and his chisel and he begins to chisel away everything in our life that doesn't look like Jesus. And I suspect one of the things that God is doing right now with the body of Christ is he's looking at us and he's saying, you have racism uh, there that, that is just absolutely abhorring to me. And so he puts us in the pressure cooker and, and he puts us uh, in, in those tough situations and he chisels it until it's all gone out of our life. He looks and he says, no, wait a minute. There's a bunch of faithlessness in the midst of all of this too. You, you guys are trying your best to operate in your own strength and in your own power and you're not living by faith, which is the only thing that pleases me. And so he then says, you know what? You're depending too much on your income. You're depending too much on your bank account. You're depending on too much on your own abilities. And so he puts us flat of our back where we have nothing left to lean on or to, to focus in on except him so that we can live our lives by faith from beginning to end, from salvation to glorification. The process continues from one trial to the next. That's why realizing the purpose of God is to conform us into the image of Jesus. We have to understand that. Let me give you number three, you ready? Is receive his sufficient grace. Now, I'm not talking about the grace that we all, you know, give that little cute definition of. Um, it's uh, God bestowing on us what we don't deserve. Uh, that's a different kind of grace than what I'm talking about here. I I'm talking about the kind of grace that God bestows on us that enables us to make it through the exigencies of life, the tests of life, the trials uh, of life, those difficult times. Now watch this with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13. There's no temptation that has taken you except which is common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear and will with every temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Two or three things here that I, I want to I want to extrapolate out of this. You ready? First of all, the word common. Um, but but let, me, let me back up and, and take that word temptation. There's no temptation. That, that is a bad old English translation. It, it's, it's not like enticement, but it really better translates it to test. It's a trial. There's no test. There is no trial that you're going to go through that is not common to everybody else. Some, I have had that statement made to me numerous, numerous times. Well, pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. Well, yes, I do. And the reason I do is because, you know, the circumstances may change. The intensity may be different. The faces and names may be different. And the dates may be varied. But the fact of the matter is we all suffer and we all go through tests and we all go through trials and so the word of God says that yes, we can understand each other because this manner of testing is common to every one of us. We, we all go through it. Now, notice the second thing that he says here. He says, um, God is able here in the midst of this that uh, he will not tempt us and test us and send us through trials that we are not able to withstand. He says, I'm not going to put that on you. Now that, you say, Pastor, that all sounds good. 
that, that makes good preaching. But pastor, the fact is I'm human and I have limitations in my life. Well, don't you know that God knows what your limitations are? God understands where that line is in your life. God, God understands how far that you will, can go. And he says, I'm not going to go beyond that. I know where they are. And then notice what he says, that he will make a way of escape. You say, well, glory to God, thank you. That, and, and that's the mindset when we are usually going through a test or a trial, you're looking for a way out. Unfortunately, that is another one of those old English bad translations. He's not saying, I, I'm going to give you the grace to find a way out of what you are going through. But the grace of sufficiency that God is referring to at this point is not to escape and get out of it. I'm going to give you the grace to go right through the middle of it. That's the word. That's the scripture passage that is here. Here's what I have uh, been rejoicing over. The NFL is finally going to get back on the football field. Hallelujah, glory to the Lamb, God's still answering prayer. Somewhere after the first of the year, there'll be a couple of teams that are going to engage in the Super Bowl. Well, you don't get to the Super Bowl without going through the battles. What they're doing now is they're going out and tackling dummies and they're doing the resistance training and they're doing all of the preparation. And then you have to understand that there is no victory without going through battles. I've come to the place in my walk with God that I understand that God doesn't owe me any explanations for everything that happens. He has proven to me over and over again that he loves me and that's enough to carry me through the times when the answers are not there. His grace is more than sufficient. I'll give you number four. You ready? Say amen if you're ready. Here we go. Remind yourself that his ways are not our ways. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Do you remember the passage uh, where the fiery serpents were biting the nation of Israel. Do you remember? I mean, they were just everywhere and people were dying. And, and, and now, if that were to happen in a modern contemporary time in a church much like this, one of the first things that leadership would have done is that we would have put together a committee to try to eradicate the serpents. That's an act. God's act was to allow the serpents to bite the nation of Israel. But his way was not to obliterate all of the snakes. His way was to put up a pole with a serpent on it and said, if you will look, you will live. We cry out, God, why didn't you just kill Hitler? God, why don't you kill all of the drug addicts? That, that would have been kind of the way that some of us would react, but that's not his way. His way was that he put his son on an old rugged cross and he extended him above the earth and he said, if you would just look, you will live. That's God's ways. Um, God revealed his acts, A-C-T-S, to Israel. But he revealed his ways to Moses. It was the act of God to allow Rome to put Paul in prison. But it was the way of God that showed Paul and all of us that his grace was sufficient in the midst of his imprisonment. It was the act of God to allow an old man by the name of John to be exiled on the Isle of Patmos in that old rocky stony ground but it was the way of God 
to get John isolated and alone so he could pour into him the revelation. Um, you cannot interpret God by his acts. You interpret God by his ways and the mystery of his ways. I don't understand the acts sometimes. I just trust his ways. Number five, recognize who God is more than what God does. Here's the most common way that most of us go about life is that we come to a determination about who God is by what God does. And oftentimes we allow the circumstances to act as the thermometer of the spiritual life that we are living. As long as everything is going like we want it to go, as long as everything is going smoothly like we expect it to go, then we have a very high view of God and we're on top spiritually. But let something happen is unexpected and unwanted and uh, really uh, not what we had looked for. All of a sudden, our spiritual thermometer is registering extremely low. And if we allow the circumstances of our life to dictate how we view God, then life is going to be like nothing but a roller coaster of up and down and up and down. You cannot see God through your circumstances. You have to see your circumstances through God. I think about, uh, you say, well, why, why, why? It's pretty simple because circumstances change, but God never does. I, I think about the disciples in the New Testament. Uh, when, when they were so excited, they came running over to Jesus and they said, oh, Jesus, do you know that even the demons are subject to us? Do you remember what he said? He said, don't rejoice because the demons are subject to you. Rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Do you know why that he said that? He knew that there would come a time that they wouldn't be able to cast out the demons. And it would affect their walk with him dramatically. And he says, don't get focused in on the circumstances. They may be different next time, but God never changes. I believe with all of my heart, folks, that one of the things you and I can rejoice over this morning is that we serve a God who never changes. He's the same today as he's going to be tomorrow and as he was yesterday. I'll give you the final one. You ready? Rejoice of his promise for tomorrow. Disappointed? Let down? Hurt? Things didn't turn out the way that you thought they were? Understand you and I are citizens of the kingdom of God and thank God that this book has shown us how everything is going to turn out. Does God always come through? From our perspective, probably not. But ultimately, it sure does. And he sure does. These three Hebrew boys, go ahead, you know. You, you do what you gotta do, king, but understand something. Uh, God is able to deliver us, but if not, we're still going to keep on serving. We're still going to keep on praying. We're still going to keep on loving. We're still going to keep on praising. Heated up that furnace seven times hotter than it had ever been before. And he took those three Hebrew boys and he threw them into that fiery furnace. They looked and yea, there was a fourth man in the fire. I don't know who that was in the fire. 
could very well have been a pre-incarnate visit of the Lord Jesus. Could have been an angel, but there was a deliverer in the fire. The boys came out of the fire and the only thing that had burned were the ropes that had bound them. And they didn't even as much as have the smell of smoke on them. But what, what's the lesson? Here's, uh, here's what God's doing in me. I'd rather be in the fire with Jesus than I had to be out of the fire without him. Our God is able. But if not, would you stand with me and let's pray together. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. <clears throat> I was talking to a pastor friend of mine prior to the day and I told him what I was going to be preaching on and he said to me, Mike, that room is going to be filled with people that are suffering disappointment. In a moment, those of you that God has really spoken to today in the midst of your disappointment, I want to ask you to get your mind and your heart and your eyes off of your disappointment and get them back on Jesus. He never changes. What he's doing is helping you to become more like Jesus. That's his purpose for your life. It's his purpose for my life. That I become more conformed to him. Father God, for every heart, for every life, for every disappointment that's here, I pray for healing. God, I pray that our focus of attention would be on the one who never changes. We would not allow our circumstances to defeat us. But God, through the battle, we would find hope. We would find victory. We would find deliverance. I pray for those that hear that may not know you as Lord and Savior of their life. I pray for those that are watching uh, via the internet that do not know you, never had their sins forgiven, don't have the assurance that when they die they're going to heaven. May they just now ask you to forgive them of their sin. Right now, ask you to come into their heart. Immediately ask you to save them and commit that they will live for you the rest of their life. Lord, may they pray that in their own heart of hearts. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.